It's not every day <clears throat> that we get to celebrate a, a 90th birthday. So uh, enjoyed doing that yesterday with with Betty and the, the visit to the Ark, we're also contemplating going to the Creation Museum, which is about 30 miles away. And it was either Bill or Fred, they said, this will be kind of like a week-long Brothers Keepers meeting. <laughs> so anyway, we'll be talking about that and anyone who'd like to go, will be able to, uh, to talk about that as we get into the new year. A few years ago, I got a call from Stafford North and he said, uh, we're doing things at lectureship this year on First Timothy, and we're going to be studying and start going down the list. We're going to be studying about teachers and preachers and missionaries, and we'd like for you to give a talk on the role of women in the church. I said, Stafford, I have a lot to say <laughs> about teachers and preachers and missionaries. Are you sure? He said, well... <laughs> Talk about getting buttered up. I'm confident that you'll give a reasoned response to some things that are going on concerning the role of women in the church. Obviously, this is not my favorite topic. However, uh, one of our commitments should be to always teach the whole counsel of God. And for the 30-some years that I preached at Eastside, we typically would just take a book and would go through and work through different things. And when subjects like this came up, we were going to talk about it, and um, one of my dear friends worked in England, and he was talking with the lady about two or three different topics, and she just said, that's not in my Bible. He said, well, well yes, it is, and she said, no, that's not in my Bible. He said, here, I'll show you, so he turned to her Bible. She had taken her scissors and had cut that part of Scripture out, so when she said, that is not in my Bible than what she was saying. I don't like what the Bible says about this. So I've just taken scissors. And so there was just a blank space and she had cut those particular things out because she didn't want to do that. Tim and I have been really good friends, especially through affirming the faith. And not long after he had been here, I was invited on Wednesday night. And I think the elders had asked for a topic on the role of women today. And when Tim calls you and uses the word buddy and friend four times before he gets around to the topic, you know something's coming in buddy, friend, or whatever. And finally, he said, the elders have given 12 or 13 topics. I've invited 12 or 13 preachers to speak on this, and so far, everyone has declined uh, buddy, friend. Uh, how would you like to come? I think it was like the Bible and feminism. And I said, sure. If it's in the Bible, I will talk about it. Well, he didn't know me really well, and I was just talking about in some religious groups, and you go through the list. They have, um, and you just go through the list, whether it's women preachers, women leaders, on and on. And I just mentioned, um, firstly, that's okay. Because if that is their church, they can do what they want to in their church. However, if we're in the Lord's church, and he's given us very specific instructions, then we're committed to follow those instructions, whether we like them by preference, or even whether that would be our personal taste with this. One of my teachers <clears throat> had studied in the Northeast, and when he was there in the 70s, the big thing was ordaining women. And in the particular group that, of guys he was in university with, uh, their church had a conference to vote on ordaining women. And that year, it was 52-48, and I'm just doing small numbers, but it was like 52-48 to not ordain women. So the ones who wanted to do it said, now here's what we need to do. As all of those older f fellows either retire or die, let's be sure and replace them with people who want to do this. And so they strategically picked out the older guys who were against this. And sure enough, the next time the conference came, <clears throat> the vote was 52 to 48. The consideration wasn't, what does the Bible say? The consideration doesn't say, is this in God's word? It was kind of like Republican Democratic Convention. <clears throat> he goes back 20 years later, and guess what they're talking about now? Ordaining homosexuals. 
and it was the same type thing. And so if a church belongs to the people who are in it, then they can vote and decide basically whatever they want to on cultural issues. We're the conviction that this is the inspired, God-breathed Word of God, and what God intended for churches in the first century, He intends for all of us until Christ comes back. And so we're going to read through the whole second chapter because there are some other things that are there. But one of the things I always think of is that Nothing is in a letter by accident. And one of my teachers uh, through the years, he said, reading a letter is like listening to half of a telephone conversation. Something happened on the other end to bring that back. I wouldn't ask your grandkids, did any of us grow up here on a party line? Okay. My girlfriend in high school was on the same party line with my grandmother who was an insomniac, who didn't sleep, who didn't like to watch TV, but her favorite thing to do was, and it was two shorts or a long and a short or whatever, is that as soon as it quit, you just quickly put your hand over the receiver and then you just listen in. And so, you know, you, guys, you just stop and think, if you know that your grandmother's listening to 90 plus percent of your conversations with your girlfriend, that just influences what you're able to talk about but it's probably not her, it's probably the other, three, the other three neighbors as well. And when he said it's like listening to half of a telephone conversation, I thought, but you never grew up on a party line. We heard it all. <laughs> but it's still true. Everything that's in a letter is there for a reason. And so obviously some things are happening in the church in Ephesus that are a combination of being disruptive. There are things that are being practiced. And we mentioned last week, <clears throat> as far as we know, uh, this is the one place where Paul spent the most time uh, for three years while I was among you. And so he has left, and he's now left to Timothy here years later. And so some things have taken place since Paul has left, and these will be reasons why this part of the letter is there. So we're just going to read, starting first of all, and let's just read through the whole chapter, and then we'll break down some different parts of it. I urge... And here's a very significant word. This is the word parakaleo. It's to call someone close to. <clears throat> and when I hear the word parakaleo, it's a behavioral objective. Those of you who had training as teachers, each lesson you'd have a behavioral objective, which we'll look at ours here today in just a little bit. And one of the things Paul is going to say, this is something I want you to do. And he is saying, I urge. And first of all, <clears throat> and we'll look at these words in a second, but you could basically say prayers and prayers and prayers and prayers. Here's going to be four different terms for praying. And may I say it this way? Paul is saying, I want this to be a praying church. That's, that's the bottom line. I want the church to be a praying church. And so request, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. And then here's the term we're going to look at. And let me just give you these words and then we'll read them. Look at the inclusiveness. Some translations will say everything. And then in verse 2, all things, all godliness. Verse 4, all men to be saved. And you'll come to verse, um, sorry, that's yeah, in verse 6, a ransom for all. The word all is very inclusive here. So pray for kings and all who are in authority that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, and we're going to come back and touch on this, the man Jesus Christ. And I can remember very specifically, and it may even have been this passage, the first time I noticed this, there are several references in the New Testament where currently Jesus is still described as the man. Our mediator in heaven is the man, Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing is that once you have the incarnation and the birth of Jesus, when he goes back to heaven, he doesn't cease to be us. 
he had to be, the Hebrew writer says, he had to be made like his brethren in every way so that he might be a faithful and high priest. And so in talking with our children when they were small, we use the expression about God the Father. God is God, God, okay? He's always God, God. He's a spirit. But starting in Bethlehem, Jesus becomes God, man, and forever will be that. He won't ever go back to being God, God. He assumes a part of us in the incarnation. And so God wants all men to be saved. And then he says, the man, Jesus Christ, is the mediator. He gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given at proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. And this is where this discussion starts, and we'll see these words before we close today. In the New Testament, like for example, God wants all men to be saved. Here's a word anthropos, and you're going to hear, when you hear anthropos, what do you hear? Anthropology. And there's a term for mankind. No distinction, male, female, young, old. Anthropos. God wants all people, all men to be saved. There is a male-specific term called aner, and that's male-specific. And there's a female-specific term, and it's gene, and you will hear gynecology. Virtually all of our medical-type terms and things come from the original Greek word. And so when Paul wants to just talk about us, he will use Anthropos. God wants all men to be saved. Everybody. Then, when he wants to talk about male specific, he will use an heir. And, when he, and it'll be either male or husband. And then when he wants to refer specifically to female, as in wife or just female, he'll use the term gene. And so Paul's very specific here. I want, all, I want men, male specific, to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger or disputing. And this is something very important that Paul addresses in terms of uh, the church in Ephesus. And then he says, I want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And it wasn't just women of the street, but particularly women who were involved in like the worship of the Temple of Diana and things, the focus was all the extravagant things on the outside. And Paul is just basically saying, ladies, I want there to be a difference between how, and it's not just the woman of the street, but let's say the woman of the world. I want us to dress differently from the women of the world because of those who profess godliness. <clears throat> My wife did not like this, but <laughs> we still, was our discussion. We had two girls, okay? And I said, let's just face the fact, and I've told this to some of you, let's face the fact, you know, you're Church of Christ preacher's daughters, you're going to school, and here's the deal. Somewhere between looking like a nun and working on a pole is where we're going to live. We're going to find a middle ground somewhere. I do not want you going to school looking like that you live in a monastery and... Neither do I want you to go to school looking like you're working on a pole. And my wife said, couldn't you? I said, no, that's exactly what I mean. Those are the parameters. And I want you to be fashionable. I want you to look nice. However, I have the right to ask either for another layer or something else. And only two or three times I say, sweetheart, that's really cute. But dad needs another layer or something. But what are we talking about? Modesty and let's use the term immodesty, it's not even so much the length or the shortness of it, it's calling undue attention to oneself. We had a godly, godly woman in our congregation, a preacher's wife, and she went with her husband to a church in an area that was not economically uh, as prosperous as some others. And she didn't think a whole lot about it, but she just said, I wore... And they weren't expensive, but she just wore some pearls and some other stuff. And she said, 
you know, if I go back, I'm just going to dress down a little bit because I don't want the other women there to be self-conscious either about themselves or about me. So when he talks about this thing about modesty, and as we talked about in our house, it's this middle ground where, and as our girls came and went, their mother would say to them, we want you to be as beautiful on the inside as you are the outside. And so we've seen some people that the whole focus is just on the outside. And so that's what he's saying. And he's not saying that we can't be fashionable. He's not saying that we should look like we're living in a monastery. But the focus is to be on the character in the heart and not just the things on the outside. My grandmother, they ran a country store from 1924 to 42. she was the midwife for 25 years to the majority of kids who were born in the New Liberty community. She literally had, had brought them into the world. And growing up, especially as a teenager, she'd say, son, some girls have the looks of the model, sorry, have the looks of the model and the maternal instincts of a mannequin. <laughs> you can marry a pretty skirt and be hungry for the rest of your life. And what she's saying, some people the focus is just on the outside. And what Paul is saying, and this is going to have to do with our worship and our behavior, women who, who with good deeds profess to worship God. Then we come to verse 11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. And then here's the rationale. Adam was formed first, and then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner, but women will be kept safe through childbirth if they continue with faith and love and holiness with propriety. And so, these instructions are here because matters have arisen in the church while Paul has been gone, and he tells Timothy in chapter 1, yes, people have come and are teaching different doctrines, Different things have arisen, but also there have become problems with the assembly and the worship of the church. So here's our central idea. If you have the outline, that's CI. Paul gives clear instructions concerning men and women in worship. And our aim is just to be able to distinguish between the different roles that Paul assigned to both men and women in worship. You know... The years we worked in Australia, the majority of people who came to the church had never, ever read the Bible. And one of the things that my brother Kent would just talk about at different times, he would just simply say, none of the Bible was written to us. All of the Bible was written for us. And I believe because of the nature of inspiration, everything that we're going to need that Peter's going to talk about for life and godliness is preserved for us in the writings that are there. And when you look at the New Testament, and look at this in terms of the world religions, if you do a study in a class on world religions, firstly, none of them have letters as a part of their uh, doctrine or their their stance of belief. Uh, There's some type of, you know, essays, their convictions or other things. But one of the unique things about the New Testament is we have kind of the foundation, half of it is the life of Christ. And then Dr. Luke gives us volume two, Acts. And then we have these different letters that describe the challenge of godly living. And once a person hears the gospel, once they're immersed in water for forgiveness of sins, then the letters say, this is how you live godly lives. I'm confident that Paul probably wrote a whole group of letters we don't have. But the Holy Spirit who guided the inspiration is also going to be involved in the preservation of that and so when you look at the new testament then and if you look down two three the letters are sometimes called occasional letters do you remember in the book of corinthians paul will say oh i have heard about or someone from the household so there's an occasion something has taken place you don't just write a letter for no reason at all And so something has taken place on the other end. And so because of that occasion, then Paul is going to write, and again, with the church in Corinth, there are different ones. 
And this is just my term. I, I, I never cease to be amazed, and I use the term academic gymnastics, to the degrees that people go to say, well, he either didn't mean that or he didn't say that, or that isn't for us today. And through the years, and obviously this isn't a hobby, I don't talk about this all the time, but I've talked with a number of people, and I'll just give you some examples later, where, yes, that's what Paul said, but, and then here will come some rationalization or justification for it. And, like I said, I believe our New Testament's inspired and is written to us for matters of life and godliness. This is one of the craziest ones. I've had people say, how do you know that they weren't just different churches in the first century like there's different denominations today? How do you know the church in Ephesus was like the church in Corinth? And I always remember 1 Corinthians 4, 17. And again, in this case, I've sent Timothy, Paul says, to Corinth, my beloved and faithful child, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So what's Paul saying? Whatever I'm teaching the church in Corinth, that's what I'm teaching the church in Ephesus. And again, the desire sometime to either sidestep or to... Uh, negate some of these teachings and remember in Galatians oh someone teaches a different gospel then Paul is very specific about uh, referring to that so here's number one here's the admonitions concerning prayer and basically prayers to be for all people both in our personal lives and in our collective church life um, we just can't overstate the importance of praying and this is why when Paul is writing, this is what I want you to do. I urge you to do this. Then here are these lists of things that he prays for. Supplications, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving. And again, here's our all. All people, all who are in high positions, all people to be saved and was given as a ransom for all. So if you look on the next page, this is very important because Paul just mentions a whole list of things. And if you remember from the first chapter, there's all these descriptions of people who are teaching other doctrines or teaching things that lead people astray. And two things happen with false teaching. One is the fact that it's false. But two, it, it's not spiritually helpful and nourishing. And so when Paul started, and he's going to use this term and we didn't describe it today, but the term sound doctrine I grew up hearing the term primarily, meaning what we teach that's different from other people, and that is a part of it. But I think, the, I think the way to the passage is the word sound is the word healthy. So what's wrong with the false teaching is that it's not only false, but it's not spiritually healthy. And so when Paul will talk about sound doctrine, then these are the things that are good for you, and they are sound in that regard. But briefly, here are the words. Supplication is a prayer to God to meet a specific need, a petition, an entreaty. And as Bill mentioned in the announcements, various people we have prayed for specifically, that's supplication. Prayer is a general word for an address, a personal address to deity. So this is when we approach God through Christ. Intercession, oh, to pray for it should be something or someone. And we can intercede, and especially we hear of Christ and the Spirit both interceding for us. And what a privilege that we can intercede to God on behalf of other people. And then the term thanksgiving. One of the marks of being filled with the Spirit, remember in Ephesians 5, there's an imperative. Do not get drunk with wine, which is an imperative. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And how's the filled with the Spirit? speaking to one another psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, three, making melody in your hearts, number four, giving thanks, and number five is submitting. And it's always interesting to me that one of the marks of speaking in the Spirit, which is a part of the command, is not speaking in tongues, it's not trying to raise the dead, it's our singing, it's our worship, but number four is a thankful spirit. A mark of being filled with the Spirit of God 
is a spirit of thankfulness. And the fifth one is the word submission. And people break out in a rash sometimes, even when the word submit is used in, in any different term. You, you can't imagine the discussions I've had for the last 50 years with couples before they get married. One of the ones that stand out, and these were not members of the church, which I was happy to do their wedding, but we were just talking and she stomped her foot and she said, I don't want any of those old fashioned words like obey and submit and all this. Other. She's just going on and on and on. And I said, well, of course not. We would want to say something you have no intention of doing, do we? And my wife said, please tell me you didn't say that. I said, she was so fired up. It just went shoom right over her head. And her whole thing is, and it's true. No one's going to tell me what to do. I think the greatest act of submission is yet to take place. And when you read Romans, sorry, 1 Corinthians 14 into 15, at the very end, Christ will hand the kingdom back to the Father and will submit to the Father, and the Father will be all in all. So whatever our role in the church, it's not just what I think, and it's not just cultural. We have the example of the son who emptied himself, who lowered himself, and submission is our example of following Christ, not being forced to do something that we really don't want to do. So one, two, one, kings, those in high positions, God wants all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. That's something we always need to remember. God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. And then there's one God, and that's emphasized over and over and again, all the way through scripture. One mediator between God and man, and these are the Hebrew passages, which as our high priest, Jesus is our intercessor, our mediator in that sense. And then here's references, and I'll leave you to look at these, but it's the man, Jesus Christ. Remember Paul on Mars Hill? God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by the man, Jesus Christ. And so as you read through those passages, it's not past tense, it's not he was a man, but even after he's been raised, the descriptions are still there. And this is a whole lesson within itself, the word ransom. Um... Earlier generation, the pilot that flew across the Atlantic that they kidnapped his daughter. Lindbergh, uh, later generation, Patty Hearst. We're familiar with situations where there has been a ransom asked in one sense or another. And this is just one of those amazing things. Jesus offers himself to purchase us, to ransom us, I think particularly out of the sin and the consequences of our sin. So here's the discussion that starts then that men should pray and the discussion about women. And we've already talked about this in terms of the modesty. When you look at the verse at the bottom, <clears throat> well, let me say it this way. My son visits a church 20 years ago and three things were said during services that morning. One was, we don't want our girls and women to feel like second class citizens. So for the wife to be in submission, the guy teaching the Bible class made the announcements as Bill did, and then he asked his wife to teach Bible class so she would be in submission to him. And then the guy that gave the sermon, about a third of the sermon was, well, what my wife wants you to know about this is. Okay? Today the church has lady elders. Because once you start justifying and rationalizing at a certain point in time, there's virtually no place to stop. And people can go to all different links. And the one passage that's used is the passage in Galatians 3. And notice the three things that Paul says. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Guess which one of those three is mentioned? Oh, well, since there's neither male nor female, then we all can do anything equally within the church. So when you turn the page... Look down at 2.1, neither Jew nor Greek. If you remember these from the book of Acts and later, Paul's going to have Timothy circumcised. Why? Because his mother is Jewish 
and he wants him to be able to go into synagogues, he will refers, re, refuse to have Titus circumcised because he's a Greek. Paul still functions within the distinction of Jew and Greek. When you look at the distinctions of slave or free, why does Paul send the, the slave Onesimus back to Philemon? Because slaves are to obey their masters. And when you look at that one verse that, that is used most often, oh, in Christ there is neither male nor female, then they don't take into ex, ex, to account the context. Yes, Paul says that. And here's the way that I think about it. We are all of equal worth, but we are all given different roles. Let me say that again. We are all of equal worth, but we're all given different roles. And what's very clear, and then as the New Testament describes those, we honor whichever role God has called us to do and to be in those different things. So when you look at the very bottom, number three, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. She is to remain quiet. And when you look down at the very bottom, this is very similar to 1 Corinthians 14, 33. He will say, as in all the churches of the saints, in 1 Corinthians, the women should be silent in the churches. They're not permitted to speak. It's shameful for a woman to speak in church, and this is the, the teaching in all the churches. So when you look on the last page, this is not something from my perspective that we do because of culture. And you look at these descriptions. This isn't Jewish culture. This isn't Greek or Roman culture. What he does is that he goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and uses the example of saying, oh, the reason for this is what happened in the Garden of Eden. Both of the parties sinned. Both of the parties were given different consequences. And in the same way that there were different consequences in the Garden, then God wants there to be different roles within the church today. And... <clears throat> Again, and I've read a lot on this through the years, you know, some will say, well, this was only for disruptive women who were making too much fuss in the church, but it's not normative for all time. And then other people will comment, and like I said this, we don't want our girls to be second-class citizens. My very favorite, and this is the one I've heard the most recently, well, you know, if Paul were alive today, and you'll just hear all these different excuses to say, Yes, I know that's what is said in Scripture, but, and then people will give some reason or some excuse for, for not following that. I'll leave a lot of this last part for you to look at and for you to read, but I just want to make this comment very specifically. Well, let me, let me come back and do it this way. We were coming home from church at Eastside, and this was several years ago, and Sheila just quietly said, did you know da 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 da, -da is going on? And I said, yes. And we go on, and two or three weeks later, we're driving home, and she said, uh, did you know about da 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 da, -da is happening or has, has taken place? And I said, yes. This happens three different times. And finally, she says, how do you worship with these people? You know, we were with the church for 41 years, the security of that is that there's very few surprises. When something happens, you nearly know whose fingerprints are on it before you know because you've just, you've been there. And I said, we not only know where everyone sits, we know where their grandparents are buried. And she says, how do you worship these people? And I said, well, it was the Lord's church before we came. We want to encourage and teach it to be the Lord's church while we're here. And Lord willing, we want it to be the Lord's church when we leave. We're to teach and encourage people. We're not responsible for what they choose to do. And this is how I see this, because you will find different groups, even within Church of Christ, who will start, and it will be small things that will be done over and over. And within our city, we had a church of over 1,000 people that doesn't worship today. And where did it all start? One of the starting places is 
uh, we don't want our girls and women to be second class citizens, so we're gonna wait on the table and we're gonna start teaching and one thing after another. And over a period of time, so much frustration and dissension took place. I, I don't take any joy in doing this. I don't feel like that as men were superior to women. I just look at scripture and say, this is very clearly what was taught in the first century. And if we're seeking to be the Lord's church today, then we need to follow what's in inspired scripture rather than either what is in culture or what do I think that people ought to do. And I know for some people that's difficult for them to accept. I understand that. Um, however, to me, and, and again, talking with our children about this, one of the things we said to them is that we don't just want to be different. We want to be Christians. You can be different and just be as weird as you can be. We're not just trying to be different. We're trying to be Christians. And when you look through this, it's very clear. When we worship, Paul gave different roles for us to have in worship, different roles in our behavior. And if you look at the very bottom, when public teaching is done, uh, men are given the responsibility of teaching. Last verse, 1 Timothy 3, 14. Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar, a buttress, a foundation of the truth. And my comment is, since it's his church, then we just very carefully try to follow his instructions without apology, one side or the other, and say we simply are trying to follow the instructions that we've been given in God's word. God bless.